We are continuing in our series called Incarnation, and we are just two days away from Christmas. Do you have anybody in your house that's just counting down the days and tells you every morning how many days are left? We've got four of those. And so they come in, well, just really just three of them tell us, the other one just coos. But, <laughs> but we have this countdown going, and we have this, we are so ready to be able to say to each other, Merry Christmas. We are so excited to get up, to spend that morning together, to be together. We're, we're excited that, that you are here. We love being a part of this faith family. We're excited about this Christmas and Advent season together. And so as we look forward to what this incarnation means, what this coming of the Christ child means for us today, we are going to be asking some important questions of how we live in this world based on the idea that Jesus, God incarnate, has come to earth and walks among us and has called us with, with responsibility to something even bigger than we can understand. So throughout this time, we've talked about some of the different titles that we call Jesus, getting ready for Christmas Eve and welcoming the light of the world here. We've been talking about the different titles of who this child is going to grow into, who we have predicted this child would be and what that means for us. So the very first week, we talked about Christ as King. The Messiah or Christ means king. So we talked about what it means to be Lord over all of creation. You see, we talk about Jesus being Lord of our personal lives. We talk about Jesus being Lord of the church, but Jesus is also Lord over all of creation, over everything. And so what that means for us is that if we serve a king, that means that we are subjects. And we're usually not very excited about being subjected to anything that we don't want to be subjected to. But yet we are these subjects and it has and if we are subjects of the king, then we, leave, we live in that kingdom. And so what it means to first be citizens of the kingdom of God before we are citizens of anything else, including even our own families, what does that mean for us as we walk out of here today? Secondly, we talked about what does it mean for Jesus to be Savior? What does it mean for Jesus to be Savior? We talk about it when we walk down, we call it Romans Road to Salvation, and we come to the altar and we have a prayer and we invite Jesus into our lives and into our hearts, and we, we understand that to be Savior, but we are also saved to and from things right here on this world. We believe that through the power and strength of Jesus Christ in this community of faith together and in this world that we can be saved from the darkness that, that tries to overpower the light right here in the here and now, not just fire insurance for the future. I, I was thinking the other day, this is just something I guess a preacher thinks about, I don't know. But if all we were worried about is eternity, all we would need is that little Boy Scout building. And it'd probably just be me and an assistant and we would just file away your, your fire insurance, right? In that little building. But there's something more. There's something greater. There's something bigger. There's something even now that must be done because this Christ child has come to earth. And so then last week we talked about what it means for Christ to be Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. We talked about how this Christ child has come to be the incarnate, the deity of God has lived on earth, wrapped in the flesh of a human being. That God knows what it's like to be human, that God understands us, that God has walked the roads that we has walked, that, that God has wept for the loss of a loved one. That God has served with people who did not understand him. That God has been persecuted by those who wanted to persecute and hurt and harm him. That he has lived with the reality of fear and temptation and death. God has walked the roads that you and I have walked. And we know the very last verse we talked about in Matthew, the end of the Great Commission, is that, lo, I will be with you always. God is with us. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means for this incarnation, but specifically talking about the Word of God, the capital W, Word of God. You see, we're going to look in John. We've talked about some of the other events that have happened through Matthew and Mark and Luke, and I would encourage you to go back this week and to read the, um, the stories, to read the, the um, accounts of the birth narrative and to see how they are different in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And then we're going to look at John and how John's today is just so strangely different. There's no magi, there's no shepherds, there's no star, there's none of that stuff that we traditionally think about with Christmas, but yet it points to something so unbelievably true and so unbelievably powerful that it cannot be left out of the Christmas story. Now, just a few weeks ago or a few series back, we had a series called Sticks and Stones. Do y'all remember that one? Raise your hands. A little interactive time. Hey, look, the, I feel like six of you remember. That was pretty good. <laughs> but we shared this verse together. Let's get that verse on the screen, the one from uh, right there from Ephesians. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. We'll leave that one up for just a second. What we talked about during this series is how much our words matter. 
how much our words have power. Even though we, unlike God, we cannot just create things, raw things with our words, but we have the ability to tear people down to nothing. And we have the ability to take our words and to build people up from nothing into something. And when we take on the word of God and we begin to live as the living, breathing word of God like Christ, we all of a sudden become co-creators with who God is in this world and the plans that God has for us. You see, our words can inspire and our words can wound. Our words can, can build people up and teach them and lead them into the places and help shape their character to be who God would have them to be. Or we can continue to tear them apart. But whatever it is, our words make a difference. So as I was trying to think about words in my life that made a difference, I can think of two. Um, the first word that made a difference was the word yes. Anybody ever told you yes before? It's a wonderful feeling, right? Like we get no most of the time. But I'm specifically thinking about when I proposed to my wife. And I was thinking back this week, and, um, and I remember... I think I was, I was, I don't know, 22, 23, somewhere in there. I had bought this ring that was worth more than my vehicle at the time, which isn't saying a lot, but that was the case. And I remember having it and hiding it, and we were going somewhere, and I remember hiding it in this little camera bag. That was back when you didn't have just a camera on your phone, right? You had to have a camera in a bag. And so we had this, this big old, and it was a huge box. I thought that was really cool. And when the guy like, do you want a box with that ring? I was like, the biggest box you've got, right? Because that makes it look more expensive. When you open up a giant box, you're like, whoa, you know? Open up a little tiny one, they're like, no, 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 thank you. And I remember getting down on one knee, and she had no idea that I'm aware that it was coming. She had no idea it was happening. I got down on one knee, and I was just shaking like a leaf. I was just shaking. And I remember she told me later, she was like, I was thinking, Lord, have mercy, what is wrong with him? <laughs> <clears throat> and then I asked her, and I said, will you marry me? Will you be my wife? And she said, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And she stood there. For a really long time, <laughs> people had like stopped and were watching and they were like, this guy's getting told no. <laughs> like everybody stop and see what happens here. There's like some old guy was in the background, like giving me a thumbs up. And I was like, I don't think you understand what's happening, buddy. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, and anyway, and eventually I looked at her and I said, is that a yes? And she said, oh, yes, 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 yes. You know, and then, you know, here we are. And so... But I have been amazed from that moment on, and this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it gets into what our commitment to Christ means today. I'm amazed at what that one word has meant for my life. I'm amazed, first off, that she could be surprised. Maybe she'd already thought about it. I hope she'd already thought about it, I guess. But in one moment, we attached our wagons together, and we have not been separated since. In one moment, we have given our lives and all that we are to each other. And perhaps we've had that experience with who God is in our life. In one moment, we have attached our life to the life of God in this world, the life of the kingdom of God here in this world. I remember going through disciple Bible studies. Anybody been through the disciple Bible study? And at the end of it, you go around and you affirm each other's gifts and you talk about how, you know, Mike could be in service to the church and what that would look like. And the pastor at the time, who I really respected, looked at me and said, do you think you have a call to ministry? And I told him, no way, Jose. And then here we are. It was a powerful word in my life, something that stood out and that helped shape who I am and who I would become. You see, as we go around, this is a beautiful time of the year, I believe, for church, because no matter where we go, we hear our church words, people saying Merry Christmas. We hear holiday choruses and hymns and things coming over the loudspeakers at, at stores and, and lines, and I'll just hear, I'll roll my window down every once in a while, and somebody next to me will just be singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing or some contemporary Christian song or something like that. As we begin to walk around in this world, the words of our faith are all around us. The signs of our faith are all around us. This is a very comforting and forgiving and loving time as people in the church because our faith is now alive and active in the world that is around us in a way that sometimes it feels like it's not in January through Thanksgiving. Our faith has come alive. You see, Christmas is full of comfortable and soothing words. But these words are not just for you and me. These words are for all people. Jesus Christ is Lord over all creation. And even people who are outside of the church find comfort and meeting in this time of year in the words that you and I share up here on a regular basis each and every Sunday and in Sunday school and in our homes. But now these words have come to bring comfort to more than just us. 
Now, we're going to dive into John. John tells the story of creation, or not of creation, excuse me, I kind of jumped ahead of myself, tells the story of Jesus' birth pretty strangely. So we're going to look at John 1. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, you can flip along with me. John chapter 1, and it's kind of rhythmical. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, here's what I love about this. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. Have you all ever seen a movie that starts once upon a time? Well, you notice that this story of who Jesus is starts once before time. Before there was even time, there was Jesus. Before there was a way for us to understand a chronology of events, before there was matter, before there was physics, before there was anything that we could grab a hold of in our lives, there was God, there was Jesus, there was this spirit, three in one, this trinity, once before time. What came into being through the word was life, and the life was the light for all people. Now, in our Christmas Eve services, like we do every year, because it's a beautiful and wonderful tradition, we're going to light our candles together here in the sanctuary, sing Silent Night, and go out into this world to be the light. If you've been a part of a Christmas Eve service, it is absolutely beautiful. When I was first starting out as a pastor, and I was getting ready for Christmas Eve service, and I was planning things out, I called a mentor of mine, and I said, you know, are there any, like, creative elements we could use? And it was my first time, so I just wanted to, you know, wow, everybody. And I was like, are there any creative elements? And he said, if you don't light the candles and sing Silent Night, you're doing it wrong. And that was his only advice. But we light the candles. Because what came into being through the word was life. And the life was the light for all people. For all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. I'm sure you've thought about that or this or pastor has told you before. But one of the things I love about the image of Christ being the light and everything that is evil or wrong with this world being the darkness is you realize that, that darkness isn't a real thing, right? It's not a tangible thing. It is the absence of the light. Darkness cannot overtake the light. Darkness cannot overtake anything. It can only live in the absence of the light or behind an object that blocks the light. And so we as Christians are called to be that light and not objects that block the light. We're going to skip down to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. You see, God has come to us. Just like we talked about last week, God has come to us, but it is a gift. God is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the capital W Word of God. You see, John ties this all the way back to the beginning of creation. When we say, in the beginning, what do you think of? Genesis 1, the very start of the Bible, right? We talked about it. Y'all are getting ready for New Year's resolutions, I'm sure. There'll be some of you who say, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. You'll read Genesis and then kind of tail off. But you'll remember that in the beginning, it's probably the most read scripture in the Bible behind like John 3, 16, because everybody flips to Genesis and starts, and then that's all you got. In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, in this moment of this Christ child coming, we are a part of God's new creation, not just the creation of old, but a new creation. We're going to share with you from Revelation. We're going to throw Revelation 21 up on the screen today. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. This is the appearance of Jesus Christ into this world to usher in a new creation, to usher in a new Jerusalem, a time where the old has not yet quite passed away, but a time where we are beginning to make and to shape and to usher in and bring down God's will from heaven like we pray with the Lord's Prayer every week. This is the world that we are called to, this new creation. The Word has become flesh. Something that I love about this time of year is this realization that the message is the messenger. You see, the prophets and the poets, the words that God has given us throughout time to talk about who God is, to understand how God would have us to be in this world, we have taken those words and God has wrapped them in flesh and given them to us as a gift. 
God has said, here, all of the words that I could possibly muster, all of the ways that you can understand me, all of the things that I want you to be and to do, I am going to give to you. I have wrapped myself in flesh, and I am sending myself as a child, as a babe, to grow up in front of you, to walk before you, to walk beside you and with you, and lo, I will be with you always. Christ has come to meet us, to walk with us, to never leave us. And so as we celebrate the shepherds, and as we celebrate the magi and the star, and all of the wonderful, just absolutely beautiful things that there are about Christmas, we remember that God's word that began with creation has come to us, has come to life, has been wrapped in the flesh of a baby that we will celebrate tomorrow night, and it has been given to us as a gift so that we can bump into the word of God, not just think about it in theory, not just believe it to be words on a page, or not just believe it to be something that happened and used to come people come to people a long time ago, but never really comes to me, right? I hear often from folks, you know, I always pray to God and ask for things, but I never really hear anything. Well, we have been given God incarnate, wrapped in flesh here on this earth. We have seen what it means to live and to breathe to help and to heal, to walk with and to sit beside, to weep and to lament and to be tempted and to find joy and to help and to feed and to clothe. There is power in the word made flesh. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what does this mean for us today that the word has come to life right here in front of us and that we will hold that word in our arms? You see, we are not called to just listen and find comfort. I'm afraid that that's one of the things we can sometimes do during a season such as Advent leading into Christmas is that we walk around and we feel a little more comfortable and we're glad that the world is beginning to say some of the words that we have been saying for a long time and it looks a little bit like the kingdom of heaven and we can just sit back in our easy chairs and, um, uh, and just sit back on our blessed assurance and we can just know that we have what this world is talking about. But God calls us to something more. We are called to become the message and the messenger. The exact same way that Christ did. The only Christmas story that some people may see is your life. The only Christmas story that some people may be able to comprehend and understand will be the embodiment of Jesus Christ in you, walking around and bumping into each other at Target, on the roads, at work, at urban ministries, or whatever it may be. We are called to be the message of Jesus Christ. We are called to be Christ's messenger. I, I saw a beautiful example of this this week. They probably didn't think anything about it, but our, our group that packs for our fuel program was downstairs you know, dark, it's cold out one night, and they're getting ready to pack these bags. And it's not really glamorous. If you've ever packed bags before, there's nothing glamorous about it. It's just a bunch of Tupperware containers on a table full of different items that we give to these children. But yet, that is when the message can become the messenger. When we reach into these containers and we pull out these little gifts of love, these little pieces of hope, and we give them to these children who need just a little extra care, and we pack double bags going into the holiday so that they can have a little bit more that they might not have had before, so that they can spend some of their resources to have some joy and gifts on Christmas instead of having to worry about their snacks and lunch for a couple of days. We reach into our pockets. We reach into our time. We give of ourselves so that someone else can have a little more, a little joy, and a little faith. You see, the glory of Christmas and the light of Christ shines through the willingness of ordinary people. The glory of Christmas and the light of Christ shines through you and through me everywhere that we go. And so this Christmas season, I just want you to have such a beautiful time. I want you to enjoy your families to enjoy getting together. For those who have experienced loss, I hope that you get to experience some joy and care as well. But I want us to also remember that Jesus never cared about our comfort. Jesus always cared about our character and who we were being called to be. 
And so we enjoy this time, this gift that we have been given. But we are called to continue to be the message that has become the messenger. Let us pray.